Um, I will go into some of these buildings I posted on the Instagram. Uh, that's the basic. Uh, these are buildings that I've visited in the last two years. That's how long I've had this account. And um, I've taken the photos with my phone. Um, many times, not so much time. It's uh, on study trips, it's on work trips, uh, everyday life vacations where we meet these buildings. <clears throat> and um, which uh, buildings I, I posted, I, I've also added the, the name of the building, the architect, the city, and the year. So this format, I think, um, gives a kind of a basic um, information. And then there is something, as uh, you said, Alice, also there is something about the format itself that lends itself to um, going into in a visual way about um, the buildings at, and yet don't you don't have to put so much information there to be able to get a rather rich um, interpretation possible but um, um, so I will get into the buildings but and now I will share my screen so we you will see the sort of desktop version of Instagram which uh, is a little weird um, at least for me I think it's um, most of the times so use on the phone um, and there will be some, of course, um, it's not on, all, always going to be smooth going big, back and forth. I hope you have uh, patience with that. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna share my screen. So, uh, yes, sorry. So I think, um, Yes, and um, so now for each building, um, this is the way it looks on the desktop version. I don't know if you, uh, perhaps like me, most of you have seen it on your phones. Um, so when I click on this, um, I will go through the buildings for each. Uh, you will also see this, uh, the name, the architect and the city in the year. Um, we're going to go quite close into some buildings, um, and I think the closer we get, uh, the more we find. This is the, you might say, the the one of the themes uh, in this is that in many of the buildings, it could be buildings you know from beforehand, and many times a lot of buildings are only communicated with perhaps one iconic image or something like that, or you're categorizing it to. Um, categorizing it to um, a style or a period or something like that. But uh, this has more to do with getting very close to the buildings and experiencing details and um, reading uh, things from them. And um, it's going to be, um, I think we'll start with a, a masterpiece, yeah, <laughs> you might say. And I think we'll start with some masterpieces and then see how the things we recognize in this, uh, we also see in much uh, sort of more everyday buildings uh, around us. Um, and I think it's going to be in this first talk a lot about uh, stones and a lot of particular details uh, and getting quite close to the buildings. Uh, you remember uh, the famous Mies saying of architecture begins uh, when two bricks are carefully put together. And I think there is something um, on, I think we'll go into this um, theme on, on, that, uh, on that note. So the first building is the City Theatre in Gothenburg um, by Carl um, Bergstern. I'm gonna, yeah, so you can see it here on the right. These are the dates and the... This is one of my absolute favorite buildings. Um, it's, I think it's clearly a, a masterpiece on so many levels. It hasn't been, I don't think it's widely known outside of Sweden and perhaps not widely known in Sweden as well. It wasn't, um, it didn't fit into the overall um, way the history was going in the early 1930s. Uh, and perhaps due to that, it was overlooked. But there is a, a few words before we go into the building. This, this building is facing a very famous square and it's using the, the corner location uh, from the direction that you enter uh, from this sort of boulevard um, is using this over the corner um, uh, composition. When we look at it um, from a distance, perhaps it's, it doesn't lend itself to easy categorization, but when we get closer, 
I think what we are starting to look at, and this is going to be, I think, a lot about, um, we're going to look a lot about st on stones here. So we can see the stones um, going into the ground, the sort of sloping uh, square. You can see these rich veins on the on the wall behind it. Um, oops, sorry, that was the wrong button. I'm not, I'm not that used to the desktop version. Um, so um, even getting even closer, you can see here, um, you're starting to see something of this uh, genius and strangeness that Bayesden brought to this building where he sort of invented this kind of ionic capitals um, on these um, dark shafts in the syn syncopated rhythm that goes, follows the um, sort of piano noble of the, of the building. It floats above a kind of a modernistic or art deco um, canopy, which is um, carried by a, a caryatid. But um, I think the most extraordinary thing starts to reveal themselves when you look at it from a slightly different side. You're looking at this sort of side entrance, which isn't the ground entrance. You might say even that the, the canopy itself is, is perhaps the most famous aspect of the building. You can see this sort of um, super graphic uh, um, um, kind of cro or chrome um, doors. This sculpture by Eva Jonsson carrying the um, sort of floating um, canopy, which of course is illuminated in, in the nighttime. Um, and uh, this is a, a rather famous one from this building. Um, you can see how the character lands on, a, on the steps, going back and forth a little bit, each step carefully going into the other one. I think, I hope you can see this sort of diagonal cut here in the stone behind the sculpture. Um, there is something about these um, very tiny details that lend themselves to rich interpretation. And um, the side entrance then, uh, it's just around the corner uh, from what we saw before. Um, there is, um, everything is sort of classical. You can see the sort of symmetric axis in the middle, the different classicist elements. Um, there are very strange co uh, combinations here. So for instance, these corners on the, that are carrying the, you saw the, on the other side, we saw the canopy floating. And here we have these columns uh, carrying it. Um, in the corner, we have actually triangular columns uh, made by stone, or they have a sort of 45 degree chamfer. Um, and on this, when you go around the corner, instead of just having the sort of stone slab and the um, invented column, uh, he transposes it and uses the stone, he flips the stone in a sense. Um, I think this is quite uh, uh, extraordinary detail. You can see here actually what happens when you go around the corner, you have the final one, um, and then going around the corner, you start to see the shapes, but the, the, the materials change. Here you can see the inside of that uh, triangular corner slab or column carrying this also illuminated um, uh, ceiling. There are these rich, um, uh, stone effects, uh, grills, and I think it's important also, I mean, <laughs> one of the things you will see, and also you will see in my uh, Instagram account, there's a lot of um, buildings from Sweden, naturally, because, I mean, I do uh, document buildings for my travels, but also uh, here in Stockholm where I live, and, and work trips I take here in, in Sweden as well. And of course, Sweden, um, it might be good to remember, it was a rather poor country until after the Second World War. So a lot of the um, sort of buildings we have are ha has more to do with um, perhaps uh, finding ways to using rather simple materials in a precise and sometimes quite strange way, uh, rather than relying on the inherent richness of the materials. This is this has uh, traces of that uh, exquisite materials being this sort of public building. Um, but going around the corner, uh, if you remember the, the composition of the canopy and the sort of raised colonnade to the square, 
we find a quite different building, this uh, rather yellow brick, which is uh, common in Gothenburg. Um, we have this rather straightforward 1920s classicist uh, proportions of the window, but they go together with this rich um, brickwork, which also sort of, it doesn't go all the way to the edge. Um, the windows align sometimes to these bounds, sometimes not, sometimes to a different part of the bound. Um, when you go around the corner, he starts using it and, and stops using it. And there is something about this building which is put together by so many different parts uh, just on the exterior um, that really, it's a richness there that, that makes it strange to think why it hasn't been more widely known, I think. But of course, there is something um, inherently complicated in, in um, you know, sharing knowledge and experiences of buildings uh, that are very rich when you only have perhaps one image that you can choose. Um, so in this sense, instead, um, there are a lot of images of, of each part, and I think you will make your own sort of composite um, reading of it. So one of the extraordinary things about the, um, and this is almost not at all known in Sweden, history. So on each side of the theater, there are these uh, magnificent staircases. Uh, they go up in the, the sort of brilliant Pernesian uh, fashion. They land on different levels, they have different shapes. These are the windows you saw on the outside on that sort of heavy brickwork. Um, on the inside here, you have these elegant uh, stairs going up and around and these chrome uh, railings. And when you start to look at all the, the ways they sort of, they meet and they land and the chrome lands on the stone, in different ways. Um, there, there is something about this kind of space that contains so many particular, particularities and details that almost impossible to, to reduce. It would be very sim difficult, I think, when you see a lot of images of a space like this to see how it could be, you know, discussed by choosing just one or two. So, you, I mean, there are these quite elegant elements, different curves, sort of following the line, not following the line. Um, very complex uh, geometries, of course. And then if you go into the, some other, more detailed images of the stair and also the rail. Um, you can see this, um, and of course, this is one of those stairs that you have on the post um, 19th century, like theater and opera buildings where people from different levels, different um, uh, parts of perhaps they bought different tickets. They come out on different levels. Uh, they go here, and and this is just before they go into that sort of black box of the theater. They see these um, exquisite um, uh, spatial drama and these details. And um, and this is one uh, masterpiece. I think um, not just looking at the stars. Um, the rest of the interior is also incredibly rich. Um, there are these linoleum floors, patterned, colored, um, uh, circular, semicircular shapes return, uh, rich detailing of stone. And it's a very joyous building. There are so many um, um, brilliant and um, exquisite moments to, to look at. And I think, I think we will also look at one other masterpiece just to get going. And uh, I think this, of course, is one of the most famous Swedish buildings, uh, the Resurrection Chapel, chapel by Sigel Evrens. Um, usually, you look at the building, of course, from the great axis of the cemetery. This is the door where you exit after the, the ceremony. And looking at, just looking at that door and uh, the way the stone um, sort of the marble step does go into the ground. This very simple cut around the door and how that door has been recessed is um, 
something that doesn't you don't necessarily think about those parts when you think about uh, uh, the, this ma magnificent device of the, the freestanding colonnade and the, the high um, body of the chapel. Um, but of course, looking at these parts and going into detail and, and sort of coming closer to those parts, you see how much um, care and uh, thought and joy, of course, has been put into the, these parts as well by, um, by the architect. And of course, this is the side, side way. For, if we look at the famous colonnade, of course, freestanding, just leaning out a little bit. You can see this drain pipe coming down, just where it isn't sort of touching the, the facade. There is an, I try to find, I try to, or attempt to respond um, rather directly to this sort of um, sculptural and um, mm, these elements, these compositions where you have a, a very strong presence of these sort of sculptural forms. But there are also a lot of uh, particularities of detail. I mean, I, I think everyone is probably familiar with the, the sort of the brilliance of the, the order, the, the columns, the overall shape. But there is some, some funny and um, very nice um, touches, like how the columns are standing on the gravel, and not on this sort of tiny pyramid that's on the inside. Um, with the famous slight uh, point. Um, it doesn't really touch the base of the columns. I find it interesting, these little, almost too fine lines that, that are on this um, base of the, the, the column. There are these tiny particularities. And of course, um, these are ways to just look at, these are the things you see when you, uh, visit a building, you go there, but many times um, looking at a building, otherwise uh, in publications and so on, it's by, ne by necessity, of course, it's, um, it has to be reduced. Um, and of course, the famous interior um, makes great space and light, but if we're looking, if we're keeping the, um, the eyes sort of focus on these stones and the particulars, I think it's quite remarkable this catafalque in the center where um, of course the the coffins are to be placed. Um, there are these exceptionally fine details uh, of these drapes, how they stand on this sort of mosaic floors. Um, and it's really, um, it, it's really um, something that perhaps at first you only read as a slab or a rectangular stone, but there is something about the, the fineness of the straping I find exquisitely um, interesting. The other grand element, of course, of the space is this rather strange, edicular kind of altar space um, with this um peculiarly proportioned um, top but also here at the bottom we see all these stones coming together and this is something we'll recognize in some other buildings as well these particular very thin stones how each stone either goes over or to the side of the other stones um you can see this pattern of course and um here also under the, the kind of altar-like um, piece of furniture. So there is something about coming very close to these buildings that I think might best be um, approached by taking a, a detour. Of course, uh, also, also other famous um, um, masterpieces. So if we go down to, to Portugal and um, Porto and Montesinos, um, we find this the park by Fernando Tavara, which is famous for its, its portal, which I will show a little later. If 
but um, and of course this is very close to the famous um, uh, swimming pool, the early swimming pool by Sison. Um, but in the park on the outside here, I, I found it quite extraordinary how there were these elements in the park. Um, for instance, this bench or a semicircular stone. Um, coming closer to this, you can actually, this is a very free and brilliant, you know, mastering on these forms, but you can see the different stones here on the, on the ground, of course, and on this um, shape sort of lands or doesn't quite land on, on some of them. How they all are all keeping their individual character, you might say. Um, and, and then there is an interesting meeting between them. And it's very difficult to sort of reduce that meeting to anything else than a kind of sustained uh, tension, I think. Um, of course, it's uh, a lovely setting with the, the greenery, but it's also a um, quite ordinary park feeling. But looking at these uh, elements where um, Tara both uh, added these forms and also used, uh, uh, there are these famous um, cloisters um, that were kept as a fragment. But I find um, the use of the other uh, smaller fragments with this added concrete parts uh, more interesting, to be honest. Um, so for instance, this tiny little plateau where this uh, arch is standing and how it relates to different parts of the, the park. Um, it's all very precise and done with very few elements. I, I think we see that in many other uh, aspect of his, um, of the park. Um, and I will have to scroll a little bit here. Um, so bear with me. It's, um, I'm posting these buildings more or less chronologically from where I'm, uh, when I see them, when I go somewhere. Um, and of course, uh, sometimes when you go on a trip somewhere, you see a lot of buildings from that uh, particular place. So for instance, here in, in and around Porto, we find this um, perhaps most famous uh, entrance here by Tavara, how this sort of singular stone is being raised, but not it's not really resting um, between these walls. And there is something, you can sort of train your eye on these kinds of um, details and, and elements, and then see them and recognize um, in many other buildings that we are not, we don't know our masterpieces, let's say, uh, and they're not meant to be masterpieces, but are more like ordinary buildings. And we can see how architects have used uh, parts of those buildings to, to um, you know, have the same joy of um, combining the particularities. Um, of course, uh, the most famous um, building perhaps is Tavara's Tennis Pavilion, which I really found um, one of the most extraordinary buildings. This is a building where every part is deliberately kept apart from the other ones. They never sort of merge into these recognizable sort of stylistic shapes or overall themes. And this is something that we, um, uh, I've been thinking a lot about this sort of 1920s classicism we have in, in Stockholm, where you have the ornament of the classicism uh, used in this sort of dislocated way, sort of floating on the facade, slightly pulled apart, you might say. And this sort of resistance to um, unified effect, uh, while still, of course, having a, a very uh, refined composition, I think is we start uh, looking at CISA then, of course, who is the a master of this um, particularity of, of detail. I think something which is very interesting in this part of, um, I, I don't think I'm gonna get any points for pronunciation, but the famous uh, Museum of uh, Halv in, in Porto. And this is the this is sort of famous stair going down. Um, this is from the kind of lobby space and you can really, look at the stones around the space on the floor. 
on this wall the, the going up to, to different levels and how each stone is put together. So here we have uh, on the side of the stair going down uh, on, to the, on, on the left side from this view. On the right side you can see there was this sort of straight cut on the top. This is difficult to show in one picture but, but um, so they have the different shapes and then if you look at uh, where the stair comes up you see this sort of the step of the stair going out into the other slabs on the floor meeting in this particular rather strange way. At the different heights of the stone and if you have those differences where do they meet and they always meet in very interesting ways that's a kind of a very I guess um, elegant and, and low-key um, game that's being played uh, and here of course you could see this sort of these lines between the big slabs where this um, topmost stone on the stair has been placed to sort of blend into that square and uh, of course everything is very flat or uh, the same height the same level everywhere so you can read it in a kind of minimalist way but then looking at the individual stones again we see this quite extraordinary detail I think here on the stair where you have the instead of having the the simple um, the cut the way I think most of us would do it simply going all the way up um, they go into each other and then here you have a sort of straight cut uh, landing on this lower I don't know what to call this but this gives the the other walls a kind of a almost domestic way where you have this lower um, um, part but then this sort of ends here where this lab ends and then you have the the shape of this um, this other stone slab sort of leaning up over it and of course if you don't look at I mean they're they're also quite even in, in shape and color the the stones but then there uh, and this I think is <laughs> where it starts to get interesting where by looking at something like this there and these details I think there are elements that we see in the larger composition and larger building so we can just look at this corner for instance so here we have a landing on the stair um, and that uh, sort of the floor of that landing is on top of this stair but then we have the next step uh, and then the stone doesn't go over the front it, then the front comes up but then when we start going up from the landing up the first step shows the whole stone and then uh, on the next step it's it's the um, horizontal slab that's sort of going over and there is something um, about this tiny um, choices and tiny differences that I think can sort of train our eyes and and, and see new things in quite different uh, buildings. So going back a little bit in this um, and this is also some other um, these are some buildings some other photos from a different time at the same place where this is also playing with this here the stone sort of ends on in the middle of the door. I mean this is kind of a this is more obvious to, to, to see than the other ones. But uh, I mean, it's just, it's, it's not any particular uh, point. I think it's everywhere you look, there are, there are these possibilities to, to go into these sort of extraordinary meetings. And then if we then jump back to Sweden, this is a um, residential building just um, a few blocks from where I have my office. Uh, and also where I live, um, well, close to where I live. Uh, and I think perhaps for many of us, I think we think of the Leverance uh, Social Security Building, we see the overall, overall form of this. But of course, this is kind of a normal um, um, composition for Sweden uh, from the 1920s. And uh, this is rather severe but um, a lot of the overall massing and, and so a lot of these buildings they have a kind of a strong overall shape and they have, might have a portal that's 
But here I also found this sort of SOCOL element uh, quite revealing and quite interesting. So here you can it's set into a sloping uh, street and it has this sort of low, rather strong, but also unmonumental SOCOL where you have this sort of um, height and recesses um, on the horizontal lines. But then the stones go together so as not to, to be seen as, as ashlar stones uh, in the other direction. And you combine that extreme sort of rusticated heaviness with this extreme flatness um, of the um, plastered facade and this sort of um, uh, frames around the windows. Um, these are kind of strangely proportioned kind of tiny windows, which um, uh, have this rather grand um, surrounds, which at the same time don't really, uh, you can't really see them very clearly from a distance. Uh, and then there is something like, this. Is, there is a rich, sorry. There is a rich culture of the, having these sort of portals in, in Stockholm uh, from, this, uh, from this time. So I think something like this portal here, by the way, this building is by Paul Hedqvist, who was, uh, he was, he became a very famous architect, uh, built a lot of modernistic buildings in the 40s, 50s, uh, 60s, uh, very nice buildings. But here we can see this sort of um, strong uh, sculpture forms, um, this little step going into the, sloping street. I think there is something like um, looking at almost the individual stones of all these buildings uh, that are very interesting. I mean, there are a lot of buildings around. This is just opposite corner of that building. It's this 1920s um, building by a less famous architect, Tere Stelman. Uh, at, this is using more the sort of famous Stockholm colors. I mean, this is also, um, it's using, a, a, on a larger scale, kind of basic elemental um, composition devices where it's rough, where it's smooth, different colors. Um, there are some funny uh, elements there. But a lot of the things um, I find in many of these buildings is that, that they do, they, set, they start using uh, devices, uh, things like horizontal elements, which they then can sort of play with or against. Um, and there was a building um, this is a rather a posh um, office building in the center of Stockholm um, by Erik Lallerstedt who was a, a well-established architect it's slightly early 1915 this is sort of the, the one of the first perhaps uh, towards this Nordic classicism you have this sort of pulled apart um, ornaments. Uh, but then also if we're looking mostly at the sokel here in this in this building, we'll see the way the stones are used. I mean, they combine with some um, sculptural elements like these uh, uh, sculptures at either side of the entrance. But coming closer and looking at them, we can see Oh, they are also, of course, made by these sort of granite blocks. Uh, they sort of blend into the. We can see here how different uh, stones, or rather, the same stone um, cut in a different way, sort of brings out this. Um, and I guess uh, something like this, both the enhanced joint and also the not quite hidden joint between the other blocks, it, it lands um, or it gives a certain um, um, hint to searching at other, um, in other building that it isn't any sort of sloppy decision to have this sort of big joint or small joint. It's uh, all very precise. And going from there, I think um, when you start looking at buildings um, 
sort of being almost educated in a sense by someone like like CISA. Um, and I think there is a, there is one bill I want to show another CISA, which is um, this is a, a showroom that he did. It's not one of the the grand masterpieces, perhaps. Um, it's a showroom for a ceramic company. It has been slightly redone in the interior. But then there is this um, remarkable stair here where it's not at all this um, huge stone. This is very much like the sort of um, thin cladding kind of stone. But, but this um, stair, I think, is an interesting uh, part. Uh, there are so many things in this stair. It's very joyous um, composition. So on the one side of the stair, the, when it comes down, it doesn't meet the lower wall. But on the other side, on the other side, the, the steps go out. Uh, so it's a sort of a play with symmetry and asymmetry on the overall level. On the level of the stones, we can see here also this sort of, on the upper part of the stair, this, the horizontal stone is sort of going over on the lower part it's the 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 vertical stone that's um that sort of reaches the corner and and here in they sort of meet where the the stone on the top uh which are the upper steps uh where they meet the lower steps where the standing stone is sort of uh, they crash into each other in this super precise way this is on the other side where the steps are going out to meet the, that standing slab, which is uh, looks like this from the below. And then on that sort of freestanding part of the stair, of course, uh, one single rail ends. And then in the middle is this uh, central column. Um, but also here we can perhaps look at or focus mostly on the, this kind of very um, smooth or, or not smooth is not the word, but but the stone is almost characterless. It's quite uh, even, um, and this of course brings out all this, like how how the the column has is is made up of this sort of four curved parts. How they land on the joint. How they land on the step. And all these things, and of course, this kind of a, this is just, of course, part of a um, commercial um, um, commercial environment. Um, and most of the other things in this has been sort of changed. Um, but of course, this is uh, uh, a quite remarkable element, I think. And there is something um, where you can see those. Um, things, but when you start thinking of those things, I think um, you come across um, other parts, like I was in um, Kalmar, um, and then I just passed this gate, uh, which went through the city walls, and I was struck by the peculiar uh, nature of the stonework, um, and then it turns out it was from 1931, which is, um, I mean, one year after the Stockholm exhibition. Um, there are a lot of elements here that are a little too old, but perhaps, um, or for, for to be fashionable at the time, I don't know how, how long the process were, but um, so there are things like this where, of course, if you're starting to think of the individual parts making up this kind of um, a wall, it's clear that one of the reasons of doing this kind of architecture is, is to be able to, to, to do those kinds of, of games and tricks and, and plays. So um, I do find there are these um, uh, coming across more, let's say, ordinary buildings. Um, it's, you start seeing um, affinities between different architects, different times, different materials um, that you can sort of recognize. And um, this is uh, perhaps, these are um, 
buildings from Hakan Alberg. Um, this is a kind of a, a, a gymnasium in an orphanage, uh, and it has this tiny Ashler um, entrance cube, you might say. It's kind of the wall, different steps, this unprepossessing door. Um, I th think this kind of um, composition is rather uh, fantastic. Also, standing on the edge, leaving a little shelf here. Of course, this is an uh, environment for the, um, I guess it's kind of a, a good place to climb for the kids. But, um, but mostly, um, I'm getting a sense uh, that there are a lot of tinier details there that are on one level might be as important as the overall um, aspects. This is a church on the outside of Stock Stockholm, um, just uh, also from the about the same year as that portal, 1931. Um, this architect is not famous at all. Um, it has a kind of a peculiar overall shape, this arch being not really in the center here, those kinds of things. But on the interior, there are the quite remarkable set of um, columns uh, with these rather inventive uh, capitals. Um, and there is, I think there is something elementally um, strange perhaps just having this uh, just having this, this sort of octagonal column here the other ones around at some point just ending a colonnade with this sort of strange double shape with the tiny vault so you can see that at the end here um, there is something like a um, i don't know what do you call that um, when you're it feels like there is a special kind of attention put to some of these details uh, while not forgetting the overall, you know, uh, place they have in the in the overall scheme. And you can find, uh, of course, a lot of uh, similarities between an element like this and um, elements like um, uh, structuralist, uh, uh, brutalist, um, concrete elements like this one, uh, super sort of structuralist building from the 70s at the Stockholm University. It's using this sort of precast concrete to great uh, effect. Uh, and there's of course something um, just relating to these tiny sculptural um, refinements, uh, even in a that can be found in any kind of, um, you know, uh, pre-made structure in many places. And here, of course, there is some joy of discovery of being able to use them in this kind of rich way. Um, yes, so I think the overall theme on this sort of first talk is, in a sense, that there are these uh, elements um, that we that they are there in the sort of the masterpieces we seek out, but also in, in a lot of other um, more buildings that we have around us. Um, and um, sorry, I'm going to scroll a little bit here. And uh, I think that uh, I chose some titles for for this first uh, talk, and uh, also some for the other two I'm going to have. And um, for this first one, I, um, I, I had a quote uh, which was in English, within each of them, vault after vault opened endlessly. And that's the end of, um, or it's part of a very famous Swedish, for Sweden, very famous poem uh, by Trans um that basically goes, it, ha it has to do with the experience of that you can't really, that no person could ever be sort of finished or you can't you could never have a, anyone you can always sort of see more uh, and that that is okay and there is something like that I think that is true of buildings as well that the closer we come and the more we 
uh, experience them, uh, the more we um, the more we can find. I wanted to end uh, the first today with the, the last uh, project I sort of posted uh, because of these sort of extraordinary times. Uh, it's a project from uh, London by Hanley Heilbrown. Uh, perhaps you're familiar with this one. Um, it's called Chisu Call, some student residences. I thought this a quite, on many levels, a quite extraordinary project. Um, and um, perhaps it, it is uh, gaining a particular prominence. It's, it was one of these last uh, projects I could see in this way before the, um, well, before the corona. This was just at the beginning of March, so this was just before everything sort of went down. But I think looking at this a building like this and also this uh, new building by Grafton that's um, in Kingston, uh, there, there is a utter joy and um, brilliance on, on how to use uh, particular building elements. So here we see uh, precast elements and bricks going together and the, the very precise way they sort of come together, the, the nature of the um, I don't know what to call that. Um, the uh, ab absent capital, perhaps something like that. Uh, how they sometimes go around the corner, how this, they sometimes stop. How these different panels they go together. Um, I found this uh, a quite remarkable um, contemporary project to look at. And on many, so many levels, we, you, you can see these things we, we see in these um, other masterpieces and, and um, older buildings, perhaps more, where individual elements can sort of behave in strange and particular ways, sometimes go over, sometimes stop, um, and have this sort of strong composition, strong sculptural plasticity, and at the same time having this individual elements really be, they're very, very uh, worthy of looking at. So this kind of capital, which in reality is sort of two forms meeting instead of one, um, uh, and a lot of other um, uh, very nice uh, details there. But I think I'm running out of time a little bit, so perhaps we should open up for some thoughts and questions. Simon, it's absolutely sensational. Thank you. Um, I was thinking maybe the whole series should have been called, I don't know what to call this. Uh, I mean, as somebody who, I've written a lot of building reviews, and I was very conscious when you were talking of, you know, I very rarely got to the level of observation, you know, the, the, the fine scale that you're, you're able to do in this format. And perhaps it's reliant ultimately on being able to talk to images in a very direct way. Um, there are, you know, in all of the projects, there's almost the decisions that are being made that are that slip beyond language and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, operating in purely kind of formal terms. Um, we uh, guys, we have um, a question to kick us off. Uh, mm -hmm with uh, from uh, Jonathan Woodward. Jonathan, I'm just going to unmute you and then you can pitch it yourself. Um, Hi, can you hear me? Fire. It's all, yeah, you're on now. Great. Hi, Samuel. Uh, thank you for that, uh, that journey. Um, repeating it, uh, I saw a reference you made about this uh, freer application of ornament in 1920s Swedish classicism. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of thing we see in paintings of, of Manet as well. Um, how do you see the use of, of your photographs as, uh, as sketch thoughts uh, and more generally this open access to references through architectural press and social media uh, contributes to an application of architectural language today and, and if you don't mind maybe how, how it influences your work and where you see that influences the wider uh, uh, industry. Yes, I do find that it's um, one of the elements might be this sort of um, open character. It, it's sort of open on many levels. It's accessible, it's, uh, it's easy to share, it's easy to, to buy sharing, sort of uh, connecting with people who, who can be interested in the same ways. But it's also, 
there is something I think about this uh, Instagram platform that's quite interesting that you can actually sort of leave things there. You can, it's a bit like when you pin, uh, you know, uh, you print out some things and, and pin them on a wall or something like that. And, and you can just keep them there. And after a while you start seeing things between them that you didn't see it in the beginning. Uh, and there is something about that um, perhaps presence or easy access, or it, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it's very direct. Uh, and it sort of opens up that you make your own kind of connections. So, um, of course, in the final project, you could perhaps if you took uh, an image of that sort of how that column worked and you put it next to, I didn't uh, go into so many of those, but there are a lot of, um, you know, it's like uh, like the columns by um, Leverens in the Resurrection Chapel, for instance. I mean, you, you could simply put them next to each other and start seeing things. But um, I think there is something about this format that it, it, it becomes a kind of a, a, a mosaic or a composite image of, of all the different things. It doesn't have, it doesn't necessarily know. Uh, and I think this sort of has also for myself sort of grown uh, organically. It, I don't really know um, what's it supposed to sort of say or, or what you can take from it or what I take from it. I think that's sort of consistently evolving. Um, I, I do think, as I tried to perhaps um, uh, um, yes, communicate, um, was that by looking at some buildings, perhaps some masterpieces, and then applying that uh, gain the way of seeing on, on um, let's say, things you wouldn't think of, 1970s buildings or uh, 1990s um, commercial something. And then you can still see that, well, at some point, someone, um, when they came to doing that particular thing, they, instead of perhaps just using that sort of standard detail or, or something else, that they, they did some sort of particularity. It doesn't have to mean that it's a grand, um, you know, rhetorical gesture. Uh, but it's it's an interesting thing where you can sort of find it. Uh, it's a little bit like a kind of a game where they put something in and, and, and it's able for you to find it. And, and of course, uh, a lot of these masterpieces and the older buildings, they're rich on so many levels that you can find an almost infinite amount. And for now, I mean, in current practice, it, practice it's uh, very difficult to be able to, to work with that kind of, a, you know, infinite number of, of situations. Many times we have to work with repetition not as a you know artistic choice but as a necessity of you know market and and, and construction limits but uh, so i think well you know you can't really critique yourself so i i can't really say how it sort of influences our our practice uh, or my own process but um i think it's i i hope uh it um Perhaps um, this discussion and this account and other accounts uh, of the same nature can can sort of add to uh, a culture or um, common conversation among us where we each um, gain uh, ways to see by uh, seeing the example of others who, who are seeing in this way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Perfect. Samuel, um, we, we've got to wrap up, but perhaps you could just give us a quick preview of what's next, because we, we're seeing you next Wednesday, slightly later session. I think we're starting at seven o'clock. Yes, uh, well, I think uh, then I'm gonna, I chose a kind of a quote from, you know, the famous Burnham quote, make no little plans, um, that there is, um, There are a lot of buildings that have a particular uh, quality of themselves, uh, like you're hypnotized or arrested a little bit by those buildings. Um, so I will, um, I think next time it will go out a little bit from these sort of uh, uh, rather close looks and go into this more, um, I don't know, um, gestalt or uh, this overall character of, of some uh, brilliant um, things you just come across and instantly relate to.